This is the second half of chapter four, where we'll continue coverage of functional anatomy of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. The first part ended on the previous slide here on the left, and it was covering the gram stain. Moving beyond the gram stain, which identifies roughly 95% of medically important bacteria as either gram positive or gram negative, we have to look at the other 5%. And these are bacteria that possess atypical cell walls. Species such as Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium leprae are pathogenic. And we see some pictures here that helped us to understand what these bacteria are like. Over here on the right, we have tuberculosis in some pictures. And then down here at the bottom, we have several pictures that will help us to understand a disease called leprosy. So Mycobacterium tuberculosis causes a lung disease called tuberculosis, and Mycobacterium leprae causes a disease called leprosy. In either case, the bacteria, if they were to be sampled and examined, would contain a cell wall that contains approximately 60% mycolic acid. Mycolic acid has a sticky, waxy quality to it. So when you look at these cells under the microscope, whether they're going on lab media, where they come from clinical samples, we see chunks and clumps of bacteria because of the waxy nature. They stick together. And unfortunately, because of their waxy nature, they're also resistant to many chemicals that we would use to battle against them or to control their infections. Antibiotics are mostly ineffective. There are only a handful of antibiotics that are used effectively to treat tuberculosis or leprosy. And these organisms are also very resistant to dis most disinfectants and to dehydration in their environment. They can resist drying out for long periods of time, which would render them inactive or dead, but yet these can survive for much longer than average bacteria. Also inside the human body, they can resist phagocytic digestion. So even if the phagocytes recognize these organisms, when they ingest them and they attempt to digest them, the mycobacteria will grow and multiply. And if you were to do a test for these organisms, you would, you would order what's called an acid fast bacilli test. The AFB test is ordered by doctors who are investigating a patient for suspected cases of uh, like a case of tuberculosis or perhaps leprosy, which is a lot less common in the United States. Um, leprosy is an age old disease that dates back even before the Bible of thousands of years of human history. Uh, leprosy has been observed as a bacterium that's communicable by skin to skin contact. If you live in close quarters with people uh, like the man here on the left pictured this bacterium can be passed from the infected person's skin surface to uh, a person who then will contract this disease. And the bacteria slowly over time start growing. They're one of the slowest growing bacteria. They thrive in cooler portions of the skin on the surface and particularly on the fingers and the toes and the extremities or the ears, the tip of the nose, and they start to rot away at, at these body parts. And so you can see the devastating effects, both in how they disfigure a person's looks as well as they can do nerve damage and begin to cause ultimately nerve loss and eventually bone loss to the most affected areas. So leprosy is a, is a disease that was known to um, exile people to, to colony, leper colonies, places where people would have to stay isolated from the rest of the human population because they didn't want to give this dreadful disease that was untreatable and incurable to anyone else. And strangely, leprosy remains with us today, even though it is treatable, uh, mainly in poor countries where people do not have access to medication or treatment. And also a peculiar note is that the armadillo in this center picture down here on the bottom of the screen, uh, 
is one of the only known susceptible animals to Mycobacterium leprae infection. And armadillos are now known to be a reservoir that can carry Mycobacterium leprae. And if you handle armadillos or if somehow you come into contact with an armadillo, there's at least a risk that this animal could transmit this dreadful uh, pathogenic bacteria. And so these bacteria can remain outside of the human body, whether or even an armadillo. They, could, they have a long lived span of approximately six months in which they can survive because they're coated in wax. They really, they're shielding themselves from the elements and from water loss. And we'll learn more about the treatment of mycobacterium and cases of TB, which is what's pr pr primarily pre prevalent in the United States. Uh, tuberculosis infects the lungs. And you can see in this picture here on the right, uh, this is a very inflamed, diseased lung tissue that uh, this section of the lung has what are called caseous lesions. And these are areas of scarring and uh, they're called caseous in reference to cheese. You know, and, and this is a, a quite grotesque observation that could be made in the people who, who experience the worst of disease, which eventually leads to deadly consequences. Tuberculosis can even spread outside the lungs in the blood and disseminate to various organs, especially in individuals who are immunocompromised, such as HIV, AIDS sufferers, or people who are on immunosuppressive drugs, and TB then can be devastating. Um, so it has quite a range from asymptomatic cases in most people who are infected to people coughing up blood and, um, and having disseminated tuberculosis. Also beyond the gram stain, there are other types of bacteria that lack cell walls altogether and therefore are not gram positive or gram negative. And these include the mycoplasma species, not to be confused with mycobacterium on the previous slide, which have mycolic acid in their cell walls. These mycoplasma, with they lack a cell wall, includes a species mycoplasma pneumoniae. This is one of the most important mycoplasma species. Its species name implies that it causes pneumonia, which is medical terminology for fluid buildup in the lungs. And a more thorough description of the disease it causes is to refer to it as the cause of primary, atypical, walking, pneumonia. So breaking this description down, primary would imply that no other cause of fluid buildup in the lungs is necessary beyond mycoplasma itself. It, it can start to cause fluid buildup through what would be considered an atypical uh, cause, the, meaning that the typical cause of pneumonia would be other bacteria, such as Streptococcus pneumoniae, the most common cause, or Klebsiella pneumoniae, or maybe a viral cause of pneumonia. But atypically, pneumonia can pop up due to mycoplasma infection. And walking implies that the people can be up walking around, not necessarily laying down in bed or having a lot of other symptoms other than the fluid that's building up in their lungs, which still makes it a dangerous condition. And it's oftentimes um, difficult to diagnose because doctors will order a gram stain and that'll come up negative, but then these cells don't have any gram reaction and they're also very small. So if you were to see them under the microscope, they would be incredibly tiny at just a fifth the size of ordinary bacteria like strep. At 0.2 micrometers, they're difficult to see and their shape is pleomorphic. So they have about as much shape as some scrambled eggs. The, the cell wall typically is what gives bacteria shape and these organisms do not have that cell wall. In order to make up for the 
lack of a cell wall, mycoplasmas were discovered to carry cholesterol. And this is highly unusual because if you recall from chapter two in chemistry, most bacteria have what are called hopanoids, and those are cholesterol-like compounds that help to stabilize the cell membrane. These organisms have evolved for so long that they are now known to be completely dependent on their host. They are obligate um, intra-host parasites. They do not live outside the human body or the animal that they inhabit, and they have adopted the cholesterol, a high level of cholesterol from their host, and they use that cholesterol to stabilize their cell membranes so as to make up for the, peptide, the lack of peptidoglycan in cell wall. Because many antibiotics are known to treat bacterial infections by attacking cell wall synthesis and cell wall structures, the treatment of mycoplasma pneumoniae requires antibiotics that take a different course of action. So many antibiotics are ineffective, like the penicillins and all of their derivatives will have absolutely zero effect. Cephalosporins as well. These are typical respiratory tract uh, type antibiotics that are used for more ordinary causes of bacterial infection. And many antibiotics are ineffective. At least the ones that target the cell wall. Mycoplasma is also known to be fairly difficult to transmit. They are transmitted from person to person or possibly from animal to human through close personal contact. You would have to kiss uh, or exchange saliva more, you know, more or less directly or share food. These organisms do not survive well outside of the human body for any significant length of time. Even long distance aerosols would be highly unlikely when talking about the transmission of mycoplasma pneumonia. Now, speaking of treating bacterial infections by, say, attacking the cell wall, long before antibiotics were discovered by humans, uh, nature evolved a mechanism inside of us that comes in the form of something called lysozyme. Lysozyme is an enzyme that we secrete and it's found throughout perspiration in our skin and in our tears and mucus and saliva. And lysozyme is effective at digesting the peptidoglycan, especially in its activity against susceptible gram-positive bacteria. Lysozyme has been shown experimentally to be ineffective at attacking gram-negative bacteria probably because of the presence of the outer membrane. Lysozyme has to make contact with the peptidoglycan, and so gram-negatives are not susceptible to this. And there are a fair number of normal flora, skin bacteria that are gram-positive, such as staph, and some in your throat, um, mainly strep-type species, that have become lysozyme-resistant as they've evolved and learned to live in and on the human body over human history. Uh, penicillin, which we know was the first antibiotic invented by humans, is known to also work against the peptidoglycan in cell wall formation. So the interpeptide bridges that cross-link the strands of peptidoglycan together are inhibited from forming and the peptidoglycan strands fall apart when penicillin has a chance to act on infectious bacteria that, that are inhibited by this antibiotic. Here's a question I'd like you to come up with an answer to before our next Zoom meeting. And not only would I like you to reason out which answer makes sense, but I'd like you to look at all the answers that are incorrect and understand why are they incorrect. So whenever questions are asked, 
Um, if, you know, if we have a chance to learn as much as we can from these questions, it's not only to understand why the right answer is correct, but why are the incorrect answers uh, wrong? So we'll get back to this one. Working our way past the cell wall structures, we'll then encounter the cell membrane. Let's look at some of the specifics of bacterial cell membranes. Here we can take a close-up look at the plasma membrane. This photograph on the right, taken with an electron microscope, shows the cytoplasm as having a sandy, granular looking appearance. In this photograph, and it's it's surrounded by the plasma membrane or cell membrane, which is this layer that I'm tracing here with the pointer. External to that, there's what looks like an empty gap called periplasmic space. And then after that, we have a thin layer of peptidoglycan. So we know that this is a gram negative cell. And then another gap, which is more periplasmic space, followed ultimately by the outer membrane. And so when we look at the cell membrane or plasma membrane specifically, we'd like to take into account what its functions are and how it's built a little bit. So the plasma membrane is primarily made of phospholipids. And these exist in a bilayer like structure where there are phosphate heads. And then fatty acid lipid tails that make up the phospholipids. And this works as a layer to regulate what goes in and out of the cell. We'll call this transport. Transport of what? Pretty much anything that a cell needs to move in or out. So we can talk about nutrients and any other contents that you could think of that need to come in or out of a cell so that it can make its living. The plasma membrane is also important for cell sensory mechanisms, cell to cell communication. Bacteria can actually communicate with each other through chemical secretions and receptors. And unlike the human and other eukaryotes, bacteria don't produce their energy in membrane bound organelles like the mitochondrion uh, or the mitochondria that we have. So bacteria actually use their plasma or cell membrane as the site of ATP synthesis. ATP is the energy carrying molecule in all cells. So we can see that there are many functions of the plasma membrane and um, including in bacteria, the ability for them to make energy Internal to the plasma membrane, we can look at many different contents. The nucleoid, which should not be confused with the nucleus. When we say nucleoid, oid means like. So we could say it's a little bit like the nucleus, but there's no membrane. What it has in common with the nucleus is that the nucleoid is the region where DNA is present. So we'll define it as the place where DNA is located. And that DNA consists of one single circular chromosome. The vast majority of bacteria, almost all bacteria that have been observed, are known to have one single circular chromosome. Also in the cytoplasm are ribosomes. 
ribosomes are little pieces of machinery that we can say are the sites of protein synthesis. All cells have to have a way to make proteins and the ribosomes are what make this possible. Taking a closer look at the ribosome, we can look at prokaryotic ribosomal structure. First, just reminding ourselves, yes, this is a site of protein synthesis. So we'll jot down a few facts here. But more specifically, we can say that these ribosomes are composed of two major molecules. One is RNA, called ribosomal RNA, and the other portion of ribosomal structure are ribosomal proteins. And down below, you can see in these pictures here, there's a small subunit labeled 30S and a large subunit labeled 50S. And these two, two subunits are named by their relative weights to one another. And they're not based as you might guess where you would just simply place them on a scale and weigh them. But they were determined, their weights were determined experimentally by a man named Svedberg, which is where the S comes from. And Svedberg was a scientist who was able to isolate ribosomes from various types of cells. And he put the ribosome, ribosomal subunits into what he called sucrose gradient solutions. And really it was like a viscous solution containing a lot of sugar, like syrup, like honey. And when he put the samples of ribosomes into the sucrose gradient in centrifuge tubes, he would, he had markings on the test tubes. And these markings were a way that he could measure during centrifugation how far the samples would travel. So if a sample traveled during centrifugation 30 units, then he called this 30S. And this was determined to be lighter than say large subunits Larger subunits, which were heavier, would then make their way through the sucrose gradient during centrifugation at a greater rate because they were heavier. They would go down to the bottom of the, or further towards the bottom of the test tube, and they would be labeled or identified as 50S. Because of the way in which ribosomal subunits were determined size-wise or weight-wise, this explains why the complete ribosome which is a combination of 50S and 30S subunits, would not equal 80S. Experimentally, Svedberg was able to determine that whole ribosomes actually only traveled 70S units down the sucrose gradient. And this perhaps was because of fluid dynamics, kind of like if you have a large bulky item that you're trying to push through even just on the street if you had a large motor home and it's real big and heavy but then you push it to try to propel it forward it would run into some wind resistance and therefore its weight would seem less than maybe you might predict in terms of how far it would travel because it would hit some wind resistance and so he was able to show that the ribosomes would centrifuge only to 70 units instead of their predicted 80 units. But this is the way in which ribosomal weight has remained to be measured. And uh, by comparison, eukaryotic ribosomes have slightly different subunit weights and complete ribosomal structure. And we'll be talking about that later on um, in a few slides. Inclusions of granules or other internal structures
that can occasionally be found in certain species of bacteria, depending on which ones you're studying. Um, they are considered to be intracellular storage bodies. So these would include then deposits of various chemicals that bacteria might see fit to use later on. Some examples would be like inorganic phosphate as an inclusion or granule. Phosphate is useful for so many things. It has the molecular formula PO4, and I'll not worry about the charge at the moment, but these phosphates, PO4, are essential for ATP structure. Maybe you've heard of the ATP as adenosine triphosphate, it has a lot of phosphate, and then also our genetic code, DNA, and a subset of the genetic code, which is also genetic material, RNA, and even our cell membranes. So, uh, phospholipids were mentioned, and the phosphates are essential to phospholipid structure. Nutrients in general may be stored. So some types of internal nutrient reserve that have been observed are starch granules. Some bacteria will store starch, and when we observe those under the microscope, there's a stain that reveals them called, the, the granules are called metachromatic granules and they look beautiful. They have this kind of rainbow color like a soap bubble. And there are these big bulgy starch molecules that certain species have been found to store. Some other bacteria store lipids. So maybe they need some fat for a later time for survival or whatever they might use that nutrient for. And next we have gas. Gas is found to be stored inside of bacteria, most likely for flotation. So environmental bacteria that are trying to keep their way up towards the surface of a pond or a lake or wherever they find themselves, maybe in the ocean. But flotation is necessary so that they can be at the surface where there's sun and nutrients and energy for them to make their living. And perhaps the strangest of all temporary reserve deposits are the iron oxide inclusions. They're referred to as magnetosomes. And that's because they interact with magnetic fields. And so for a long time, it was a mystery as to why would bacteria need to have some sort of interaction with a magnetic field? Are they aligning themselves with um, magnetic north, the North Pole? Uh, they, do they have some sort of internal compass for finding directions? And uh, we're not really sure, but we do know that iron oxide experimentally has been shown to have action against hydrogen peroxide. And metabolically, we can say that bacteria, especially those that live in aerobic lifestyle, may produce small amounts of hydrogen peroxide. And so iron oxide is a chemical that helps to destroy peroxide, which we know that peroxide can be used to kill bacteria. And so it's a toxic substance that some bacteria may cope with by the presence of iron oxide stored in their structures. Here you can actually see some magnetosomes uh, taken in this Vibrio shaped bacterium. And these organisms are environmental they are not, they've not been found to be uh, pathogenic or disease causing, but they're fascinating. And so there's a picture from your book. Of all the internal structures that have been found to be present in various types of bacteria, endospores might actually be one of the most important of all. Endospores, endo means inside, and spore is referring to a dormant resting body. And it's important to understand that endospores are not produced by all different types of bacteria, and not all species can produce these endospores. But the ones that have been found to have this capability are primarily gram-positive rod-shaped bacteria. So we'll abbreviate that GPR. And not all gram-positive rods can form endospores, but the ones that do, by definition, fall into the category of bacillus species.
and Clostridium species. And our book goes on to mention Sporosarcina as an environmental isolate that can also form endospores. I'll just focus us in on Bacillus and Clostridium because those are disease-causing organisms that can, can infect humans and even cause deadly disease in some cases. Sporulation itself is a process by which a spore forms and this is where an active bacterium enters into a dormant state. And it does so to escape impending doom if an organism that can, that can form endospores senses that the end is near, that nutrients are running out, and that they may starve to death, or that there's some sort of life-threatening condition like dehydration or a drastic change in pH or temperature, then these organisms can pack up all of their cytoplasmic contents, more ribosomes, more cytoplasmic proteins, and, and duplicate their DNA, and then form a spore around it in order to survive. And the survival is facilitated by the fact that the spore is encased in four layers of a protein called keratin. And this keratin is like the protein that keeps our fingernails and our hair and our skin strong in human bodily structures. But bacteria use this keratin to protect themselves from all kinds of harsh environmental threats, such as chemicals. Endospores um, are not known to be defeated by antiseptics or disinfectants, or antibiotics. Endospores, because they're dormant, they don't take in these chemicals, and they're encased in keratin that helps them to resist being penetrated by these efforts to destroy them that we would use to control most bacteria. And they can also resist dehydration. In fact, the endospore is a dehydrated cellular storage body. All the water is drawn out and replaced with a compound um, called dipicolinic acid. And this is uh, basically a way that endospores can even survive boiling water because they have no moisture inside. Um, if they hit boiling water, they will not expand or crack open due to water becoming steam. And so endospores are very tough. They're the most durable form of life on Earth. They can also survive starvation. They can survive heat, changes in pH, you name it. So... It's important to understand that what the bacteria are doing is planning on surviving such an adverse or life-threatening condition so that one day they may encounter a desirable set of circumstances um, and they would undergo then what's called germination where they enter back into an active state and so if they sense that there's moisture and presence of nutrients warmth, then germination can be followed by the sporulation. And um, endospores can wait as long as necessary, perhaps even millions of years. Uh, in fact, the oldest endospores have been shown by research labs to possibly be able to survive indefinitely. 25 to 250 million year old samples containing endospores have been revived and the cells in fact we're able to germinate when put into proper laboratory conditions where um, they could go on living. So dinosaur age bacteria have been brought back to life or back to an active state in petri dishes. And so it's a fascinating subject. Um, now, 
here's a high resolution photograph taken with an electron microscope of the causative agent of anthrax. Now, Bacillus anthracis, we can see here one single large rod shaped cell has this central endospore. And the endospore is actually not just this dark spot in the center, but also the layers of keratin that we see here that protect the internal contents of the endospore. And this is, again, the most durable form of it we've ever observed, hardest to kill. And they remain the gold standard for sterilization. If you can kill an endospore, then it's estimated that you can kill all life forms and therefore sterilize. Endospores can be looked at as part of a life cycle. We'll call this the cycle of sporulation. And we'll start this cycle with a mother cell. So you'd have some gram-positive rod-shaped organism, maybe a bacillus species or a clostridium. And this mother cell is in an active form. And we call this active form vegetative. And this is often confusing as a term to students because we think of someone vegetating as being lazy or inactive. But when we talk about cellular life at the single cell level or in a biological sense, we say that vegetative cells are actively respiring and uh, doing something metabolically that would be considered active. And so we say vegetative. Now, when a vegetative active mother cell encounters harsh conditions, some sort of conditions that it senses could be a threat to its life, that cell may undergo a process that we can label as sporulation. And I was mentioning that this process could take a little more than a half an hour, somewhere roughly around 40 minutes or so. And different species can have different times on this, but if the average bacterium can grow and multiply uh, through binary fission in around 20 minutes, like E. coli, in this case, we're talking roughly twice as long. Uh, sporulation may occupy that much time as a process, and the sensory mechanisms are, that start this process may sense dehydration or Let's refer to the previous slide and just say harsh conditions of some sort. And sporulation involves many steps and this stepwise cascade of events can be reversed, but at some point about around the fourth or fifth step out of seven major steps that transform a mother cell from its vegetative active state into forming a fully mature endospore, the process goes past a point of no return. So it's reversible for a while until there's a checkpoint that gets passed physiologically where the cell commits to fully forming this endospore. So if the mother cell successfully fully commits to forming the endospore, then we'll see this structure form. And the structure may be round like perfectly spherical, or it could be oval, like the one I've drawn here. Endospores can be centrally located, or they can be terminally located towards one end or the other, or even subterminal, which is just somewhere in between the middle and the end of a rod-shaped cell. But we'll label this as the endospore. And the location of the endospore and the shape of the endospore actually allows uh, lab technicians and pathologists to identify which type of bacillus or clostridium might actually be found in a clinical sample or, or which species is responsible for a disease process. Now, if harsh conditions persist for long enough, and ultimately what happens is, is the vegetative mother cell 
will die and wither away. And what we'll be left with is what would be referred to as an exospore or just simply a spore. So a naked spore floating around in the environment without any mother cell material left over can survive for maybe 50 years on average out in the soil. That was one estimate uh, estimate that I've heard about that um, at a minimum decades, but under conditions that are well protected and out of sunlight and exposure to harsh elements, they may survive for millions of years. But at some point, as long as that spore remains intact, if it encounters more desirable conditions like food, moisture, warmth, then that endospore may undergo a process that enters it back into a vegetative state again. And this is a process referred to as germination. One other note that you should make for yourselves in understanding the cycle of sporulation is that this is not a reproductive process. So in no way does this cycle actually reproduce more than one cell. This is simply like a mother cell uh, going into a dormant state and then coming right back out again, but it doesn't result in offspring. It would be the equivalent of saying a bear fattens itself up for the winter to survive a harsh winter, crawls into a cave, but ultimately it may come out thinner and having survived a harsh winter in the springtime, but not necessarily with offspring. So the bear doesn't have to have had babies. And the cycle of sporulation is one of survival, but not, not reproduction. Here we have a table that outlines all the various diseases that are endospore based, including some caused by bacillus species and some caused by clostridium species. First on the list, we have bacillus anthracis, which is the causative agent of anthrax. Anthrax is a disease most often observed in animals, but it can be transmitted to humans as well. And so farm animals that are infected can be then in close contact with farmers or people handling animal products. And these animals that are infected will have endospores present in their hides where the sores develop um, as a form of the disease called cutaneous anthrax. And these infected animals then will litter the soil that they're living on uh, out in the pastures or farm-based environments. And so we can say that the soil is also a source in these areas with infected animals. And because anthrax typically gets started as a cutaneous form, we can say that the organism is actually aerobic in its oxygen requirements. And occasionally a severe, highly deadly form of the disease, or I should say most deadly, is um, what's called pulmonary anthrax. And this is where it's referred to most often as wool sorters disease because people who handle infected sheep hides um, because they they're not knowingly processing something from a healthy animal. They can come into contact with endospores of bacillus anthracis, and when they in inhale those into their lungs, the lungs are also very aerobic, and then germination can occur. And so there's pulmonary anthrax. A third type of anthrax that's the least common is called GI anthrax, gastrointestinal anthrax, sometimes gets started in the intestines when a large number of endospores of bacillus anthracis are ingested. Next on the list, we have bacillus cereus. Bacillus cereus has been found as a 
a source of food poisoning. And so certain foods that people eat have been implicated in what we call B serious food poisoning. And the abbreviation is kind of funny. B serious is funny in the sense that it's actually the least serious of all the different endospore based diseases that are on this list. Nobody really dies of B serious food poisoning, but the endospores of Bacillus cereus originate in the soil where foods are grown. So foods such as rice, which has been implicated most often, would seemingly be a type of, rice would be seemingly be a type of food that you would think would be safest compared to a lot of other foods because it's, pre it's prepared by boiling the water um, and steaming the rice for long periods of time and that would kill most bacteria. But endospores can actually survive the heating and boiling process. And so then when the rice cools, if it's not stored in a hot enough environment or it's not cooled down sufficiently for long-term storage, the rice could be in a danger zone, maybe out at a buffet for too many hours. And rice then has an aerobic environment where it's fluffy and there are air pockets between these starchy grains. It's warm, it's moist, and as Bacillus cereus endospores germinate, they can secrete an exotoxin. And that toxin is reportedly tasteless. So the person who eats this is unsuspecting. And within two to six hours of ingesting this rice, they will become nauseated and vomiting will occur as a result. Now, reportedly, the rice that has this toxin that would make someone experience the food poisoning also can survive reheating. So dishes like refried rice uh, are not able to destroy the toxin. And so that toxin is heat stable and uh, bacillus serious food poisoning is often very mysterious and goes unreported or another cause is suspected to be the issue. Next four organisms on this table are all clostridium based. And right away, let's go ahead and mark those as diseases that are anaerobically based in terms of their oxygen requirements. So all clostridium by definition are bacteria that cannot live in the presence of normal atmospheric oxygen. And so when we look at the first one on the list here, of the Clostridia, we have Clostridium botulinum, and the source of Clostridium botulinum would be the soil, once again, and especially canned foods. So foods that are either grown in the soil or may come into contact with some soil contamination and then are canned, they're gonna be sealed and therefore anaerobic, and yet they're full of nutrients. So especially canned foods that are neutral in pH and that are low in acidity. So some foods that are canned are of higher risk than others. Um, canned tomatoes and canned peaches and other fruits, those are gonna have a fairly acidic pH and are usually not a, a risk for Clostridium botulinum food poisoning. But say we're talking about canned fish or canned meat or canned beans or something of that sort. Now, if that canned food begins to swell and build up gases and a toxin known as botulinum toxin, otherwise known as Botox. Bo botulinum toxin or Botox is the most powerful toxin known to humankind. The smallest amount could be deadly when compared to any other toxin ever examined by humans or discovered. And what happens is it's just one bite of the wrong food um, could be the end. And so when we talk about canned foods that are dented or swollen or compromised in some way, when you open them, if they spew out some sort of gas from pressure being built up, that canned food item should be thrown away, discarded immediately, and not considered something that you would ever want to take the risk of eating. And when we talk about 
Clostridium botulinum. If, if someone does suffer such a type of food poisoning, their lives are at risk because the toxin will travel through the body. It'll get absorbed through um, the intestines and get into the bloodstream and make its way to nerves. And these nerves will be inhibited in such a way that uh, muscles will become flaccidly paralyzed. And because the person will not be able to use their muscles, they'll have slurred speech and blurred vision, difficulty walking, um, brain fuzziness, where it's, it's just, it's starting to shut down neurological function. And there is an antitoxin that can be given medically within a few hours if it's recognized that a person has botulism, uh, botulism food poisoning or overexposure to Botox. Let's, Botox is typically given to paralyze facial muscles so that cosmetically someone can get rid of wrinkling or, um, you know, so in small amounts, it's not deadly, but can be given uh, in that regard. But if overexposure occurs, then an antitoxin which is actually, strangely, it's derived from um, equine species. So horses were discovered to be immune to botulinum toxin, and, uh, and their serum can be used as a way, as an antidote that can be given to people who need this life-saving measure of, of recovering from botulinum food poisoning. Next, we have Clostridium perfringens. Clostridium perfringens has a species name that doesn't make it easy to guess what disease it causes, but the disease is actually something that most of us are familiar with hearing about. Uh, it's called gangrene. More fully, it may be referred to as gas gangrene. And this is where a person suffering from a disease ends up with, uh, with this disease ends up having rotting tissue, tissue that becomes necrotic and black and really the person is, is experiencing partial death to whatever body parts develop this gangrene. And the way that someone gets gangrene is estimated to be through exposure from soil contaminated surfaces and the endospores of clostridium that could be in the soil have to get underneath some sort of deep wound or puncture. And what happens is the organisms then germinate in the anaerobic tissue. And the reason for this is that there's no blood flow. The tissue is traumatized and it makes it very difficult to treat with antibiotics because the antibiotics have a tough time getting to these areas where the body no longer has functioning blood flow and is, is then an area that maybe the only remedy is to actually amputate uh, depending on where the gangrene is located. Next we have Clostridium tetani and I think most people have heard of tetanus like going and getting your tetanus shot and when do most people get their tetanus shot? It would be following a similar event to what we listed for Clostridium perfringens, the agent of gangrene. Um, tetanus is found in the soil. These organisms then can get in through a deep wound or a puncture wound. So think of an accident or maybe it's wartime and there's a, a gun or, or a bullet or some you know cut that is that produces a wound that then can develop uh, this disease called tetanus. Now tetanus can be contrasted with botulism food poisoning, where the tetanus toxin, it actually causes the muscles to spastically paralyze. So rather than losing muscular function, the muscles will tense up and not relax. And this is called tetany, as in the species name. And when those muscles spastically paralyze, a person can eventually lose their ability to breathe or for the heart to stop. Um, and this is the end result of what then is really a torturous death due to spastic muscular contraction over time as these bacteria grow and multiply and secrete more toxin. Um, the vaccine known as the tetanus shot is actually tetanus toxin 
that's been heated up so as to denature the tetanus toxin protein and make it into what's called a toxoid. And that tetanus toxoid is then injected into a person so as to protect them from the effects of the real biologically active tetanus toxin. So that's kind of an interesting point um, about how we can prevent tetanus. It's too bad we don't have vaccines for any of the other diseases on this chart, especially when we start thinking about um, this last one, which has become very common in medical settings and hospitals across the globe. And it is a soil-based bacterium that is most often found in infected patients' diarrhea. So this is a form of infectious diarrhea and it's invisible amounts of this can be picked up by people's hands. And if someone doesn't wash their hands, if medical care personnel are dealing with a person who has this awful form of diarrhea, then the endospores which will survive hand sanitizer and, um, and any other form of control other than just simply washing them off and, and washing them down the sink. So washing the hands is a key way to, to battle back against what's called C. diff colitis. So doctors in the hospital call it C. diff and the disease is inflammation in the colon that can cause bleeding and the bleeding is due to tissue trauma from a toxin that Clostridium difficile secretes and the trauma that opens up the, the blood vessels in the colon then can cause blood involvement. So in the deadly cases of C. diff, people end up going septic and antibiotics are difficult at best in terms of treatment because antibiotics are not able to get rid of the endospores and even worse, sometimes antibiotics will cause the condition to, to, to become greater because when you take antibiotics, that eliminates the good guys. So a lot of normal flora are then eliminated during antibiotic administration and vegetative active cells of Clostridium may be eliminated, but the endospores survive. And when the antibiotics are, or are done with their course, the endospores can then germinate and now they have less competition and more opportunity to populate this person who's suffering C. diff and they can end up with an even worse problem. So if antibiotics aren't the answer for many C. diff sufferers, then what is? And now we know that something that most people wouldn't think of would work, but does work, is what's called a fecal microbiota transplant. And this is just taking some stool sample from a healthy person. Take some of the fecal bacteria. After all, feces is basically almost all bacteria. It's about 75% pure bacteria minus the water weight. And you take these bacteria from a loved one, maybe a, a spouse or a close relative and this is then put back up into the patient the reverse direction. So um, this is these bacteria are then hoped to repopulate as they're transplanted into the person who needs to get some, some new normal flora, some healthy normal flora. And that has been shown to be most effective at out competing and hopefully ultimately getting rid of a C. diff infection. Here's a question you can quiz yourselves on, and we'll be discussing this in Zoom. Keep in mind, whichever answer you pick, also try to reason out why the incorrect answers are incorrect. The remainder of this lecture will focus on the eukaryotic cell. We'll look at various structures and where they're located and what they do for various eukaryotic cellular life forms. The appearance of eukaryotic life forms in Earth's life history is a much more recent development than the first appearance of life itself. The Earth is estimated to be about four and a half billion years old. And then life is estimated to have first appeared around 3.58 billion years ago. And those forms were prokaryotic 
bacterial life forms. And then roughly 2 billion years ago, evidence suggests that eukaryotic life forms developed and that we think that eukaryotic life forms evolved from arrangements of prokaryotic organisms living in what are called symbiotic relationships, where associations of various prokaryotic organisms somehow gave rise to the development of the nucleus and of membrane-bound organelles in addition to the nucleus that give us the eukaryotes as we know them today. And the first original event that may have given rise to this eukaryotic development states that organelles may have originated from prokaryotic cells trapped inside of larger prokaryotic cells that ingested them but then did not digest them as a food source. A couple of slides back, a picture of a eukaryotic cell was shown with a depiction of all the different organelles that a, a eukaryotic cell could possess and then their location. Here's a list, a dichotomous chart showing all the different various structures that a eukaryotic cell could possess. And we're going to go over all of these and just give a quick definition so we know how these are structured and their basic functions and where they're located. We'll start by looking at the motility structures that some eukaryotic cells have. Remember, motility means ability to move and the way in which some eukaryotic cells will move is either through flagella or miniature flagella-like structures called cilia. And cilia are typically more numerous and they coordinate by beating in unison to propel a cell around in its environment. Flagella are larger and function differently. They whip around like a crack the whip type of motion. And taking a closer look at the flagella or the cilia of eukaryotes, it is not the same structurally as prokaryotic flagella. Functionally, it still allows them to move and you know to have motility, but if you were to take a cilium or a flagellum and slice it so that you could see a cross section of it like we see in this drawing, inside of it, you'd find that there are several um, microtubules arranged in little doublets. And so what we see is that there's what's referred to as an array of microtubules internally. And this array of microtubules has a characteristic common arrangement called the nine times two plus two arrangement. And we can look at this drawing and we can see why 9 times 2 plus 2 applies here. So we have several doublets around in a ring. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 microtubule doublets around the periphery and then two more in the center. And what these microtubules do is they, as doublets, is that they slide back and forth on each other and it causes the cilia of the flagellum to move in a way that allows them to do like as I was describing a crack the whip type of motion. This is different than how flagella of bacteria move. Bacterial flagella swing around like a jump rope and rotate 360 degrees and then we have the flipping flitting whip cracking type motion that we get from eukaryotic flagella by contrast. And the microtubules are made of protein subunits called tubulin. So the microtubules are made of 
tubulin protein subunits. Also on the external covering of many eukaryotic cells is the presence of a cell wall. Some eukaryotes have them, some do not. Humans do not have cell walls, no, nor do any other animals, but cell walls can be present on plants and algae and fungi. And you may recall from chapter one that plants have cellulose specifically in their cell walls to give them strength and durability and algae as well. And then fungi have a special chemical in their cell walls called chitin. It helps to give them durability. And both cellulose and chitin are types of complex carbohydrates. The glycocalyx, which is an external structure as well, extending from the plasma membrane or cell membrane, consists of complex carbohydrates or Protein structures, lipid structures, all of these major macromolecules can extend out of the cell membrane to form a complex glycocalyx. And that glycocalyx can have multiple functions like the ability to attach to their environment. Glycocalyces can also be involved in um, cell to cell communication. And collectively, we can also describe the glycocalyx as an extracellular matrix, sometimes abbreviated ECM. Here's a quick question that comes up in the textbook during this chapter, and I'd like to discuss this during Zoom as well, but I'll preface it just to get your thinking started. Penicillin wasn't just the first antibiotic. It was also a drug that gave rise to dozens of antibiotics that work against the cell wall. So think about that fact and then try to answer this question about why it might be tolerated well by the human body. Now, internally beyond the cell wall, we have the plasma membrane, also known as the cell membrane or cytoplasmic membrane. They all refer to the same thing. And these plasma membrane, membrane structures are very similar to prokaryotic cells. They're primarily composed of a phospholipid bilayer and they contain transmembrane and other proteins, integral proteins. These are proteins that help to serve structure and function within the phospholipid bilayer. And the presence of sterols is also very common in eukaryotic cell membranes. So if we're talking about animals, the typical sterol would be cholesterol. And then in fungi, they have a cholesterol like sterol, but it's slightly different. It's referred to as ergosterol. And ergosterol is something that most antifungal drugs will work against. And there aren't that many antifungal medications, but almost all of them will target some form of ergosterol production or deposition of ergosterol into the cell membrane so that fungi will eventually stop their growth during um, treatment of an infection. And we can say that the plasma membrane also has a number of uh, glycocalyx carbohydrates that are associated with the, the plasma membrane as well.
Beyond the cell membrane, we see the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm would be all this volume of contents beyond the cell membrane and outside of the nucleus. So the nucleus has its own contents, uh, the DNA, the nucleoplasm inside the nuclear membranes. But beyond that, all this area here and here, that's all cytoplasm. And so we'll be examining what's in the cytoplasm, but we can also gain a little insight in this picture just looking at these cheek cells as to how large they are. Just look at the size of, these, of the cheek cells compared to the little bacteria that are stained here as gram-positive rod-shaped bacteria. There are some cocci here, and we can see when you put the eukaryotic life forms right alongside the prokaryotic bacteria, they, they just they dwarf them. And I have a curious question for all of you that we can maybe discuss if we have time during our Zoom meeting, which is, this is a gram stain, and why would it be that the cheek cells are staining gram negative? So they're reddish pink in color, and we know that gram negative communicates a cell wall structure, yet cheek cells don't have a cell wall. So we'll pose this question. Why do cheek cells stain gram negative? Bit of a critical thinking question for everyone. Let's define the different parts of cytoplasm. The cytoplasm itself would be would include all of the contents located between the cell membrane and the nucleus. But within the cytoplasm, we can talk about the fluid portion, which is referred to specifically as the cytosol. And we should also define what the cytoskeleton is within the cytoplasm. Cytoskeleton consists of microtubules and actin filaments. And together, the microtubules and various actin filaments, oops, spelled that wrong. They help to give the cell shape and structure. Eukaryotic organisms, many times, or in many cases, lack cell walls that would help to give shape and structure. And so the cytoskeleton is present as a way to give cells the shape that they need through the formation of an internal scaffolding. Ribosomes are also found in the cytoplasm. And here we can compare and contrast both ADS ribosomes, which are specific to eukaryotic life forms of all kinds, and then 70S ribosomes. Now, the 70S ribosomes are what we previously observed to be present in bacteria. So 70S ribosomes are also found in prokaryotes. But surprisingly, 
We all have some of these 70S ribosomes that are a part of us. And they're not just from foreign bacteria, they're actually inside of our cells, buried deeply within the mitochondria. And if you're talking about a plant, they can also be found, these 70S ribosomes can also be found not only in the mitochondria, but also in the chloroplasts. So when we look at ribosomes, we primarily think of the 80S ribosomes that are found in, um, in eukaryotic cells where the large subunit, or I should, let's start with the small. The small subunit is called the 40S subunit. And this small 40S subunit will combine with a large 60S subunit. And you can easily do the math here. And 60 plus 40 should give us 100S total weight. Yet, because of the way Svedberg units were defined and measured, the, the 80S ribosome uh, traveled 80S units uh, when centrifuged, and so we don't get the 100S value that you might guess would be predicted. And these 80S ribosomes are found attached to membranes in some cases. The membranes of the ER, which stands for endoplasmic reticulum. And these are membrane-bound organelles that various eukaryotic organisms have. And their function, at least the what are called rough ER, which have these protein-reducing ribosomes, that their function then is to make proteins. Otherwise, we can say that the ADS ribosomes are found just floating freely in the cytoplasm. For this section, we're going to take a quick tour through the various organelles that are located in various eukaryotic life forms and keep in mind where they are present inside the cell according to a picture like this and then what their basic functions are. First, we'll define the nucleus. The nucleus is like the brain of a eukaryotic cell. It contains the DNA, which is the genetic code. And we'll keep it simple here. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this. Just quick definitions. Um, ER stands for endoplasmic reticulum, of which there are two types. The first type of ER is what's called smooth ER. Smooth ER refers to its appearance due to the fact that it does not have ribosomes present on it like rough ER, which is the other type. Smooth ER is known to produce lipids. So fats are produced by smooth ER when cells need their lipid content. And then the rough ER, which gets its name from the rough or studded appearance that it takes on from the presence of ribosomes, is then structured to produce proteins Next, we have the Golgi complex. The Golgi complex, also known as the Golgi apparatus, is a place in the cell responsible for packaging and modifying proteins. So this would be sort of like a shipping station or a post office. 
where a package arrives and then needs to be maybe pro properly boxed and addressed and then put into an appropriate place to move to its next um, stage in, in life, whether it's to be shipped out of a cell or put uh, delivered to a certain part of a cell, the Golgi complex helps to facilitate this process. Next, we have lysosomes. The lysosome is a type of organelle that is sometimes referred to as like a suicide bag. And that's because within the lysosome, there are, is a collection of powerful digestive enzymes. And if that organelle were to break open, at the wrong time, those digestive enzymes would actually digest the cell from the inside out. And the reason the lysosome exists is because digestive enzymes are necessary. And it depends on for what event. So we can say that the lysosome facilitates apoptosis. And that would be the example where death is necessary. Every cell has its number, and cells do need to die when they should so that they can be replaced by healthy cells, or maybe as a result of aging, they just eventually are not replaced in some cases. But if cells don't die when they should, sometimes cancers arise or tumors develop, and they can actually impact the healthy cells. So apoptosis, which is technically referred to as cell, a programmed cell death, is not always a bad thing. And the lysosomes must have their activity in order to, to cause apoptosis to happen dependably. And besides this programmed cell death, apoptosis, there's also the digestion of waste. So you have phagocytes and other cells that take in contents that they then need to digest and eliminate. And the lysosomal Digestive enzymes are there and are necessary to make this process possible. Last on this list for this slide, we have vacuoles. And vacuoles are basically compartments for storage of nutrients. And so some organisms have these vacuoles, others do not. Vacuoles are very common in plants, for instance. And they use this to store any number of things for future needs. This slide lists the remaining organelles that we'll cover in this chapter in eukaryotic cells. We have mitochondria. Mitochondrion is sometimes referred to as the powerhouse of the cell due to the fact that it has ATP producing mechanisms that allow for then the synthesis of chemical energy in this form. And keep in mind, bacteria do not have mitochondria, which is a membrane-bound organelle. They, they produce their ATP in the cell membrane. And then we have chloroplasts, or at least we should say that plants have chloroplasts. And chloroplasts are common to photosynthetic organisms that are eukaryotic. So they use the sun's energy. Chlorophyll, which interacts with sunlight, will absorb energy from the sunlight and it can then be transformed into ATP energy. Next, we have peroxisomes. Many eukaryotes have peroxisomes of some sort. These peroxisomes contain chemicals that are necessary for neutralizing hydrogen peroxide. Peroxide, or hydrogen peroxide, means the same thing, has the molecular formula H2O2. The molecular formula for water is just simply H2O, but when you add that extra oxygen molecule, H2O2, or peroxide, is an unstable um, type of chemical that, that's toxic. And so this can damage cellular contents and so eukaryotic life forms of various sorts have peroxisomes to deal with this side product of aerobic respiration that we need to be able to deal with and get rid of effectively.
And then lastly is the centrosome. The centrosome, also known as the microtubule organizing center. is a place inside of eukaryotic cells to help keep track of um, the various microtubules that are involved not only in um, cellular shape but then mitotic processes where a cell prepares to undergo cell division and the microtubule organizing center is located towards the center of the cell yeah, to, to aid in the organization of microtubules. As a final topic for the remaining three slides of this lecture, I would like to introduce and cover the idea of endosymbiotic theory. Endo means inside, so internally, a type of symbiosis occurred once upon a time and may still be happening in many cases uh, where various life forms will co-associate or live with one another in such a way that there's a mutually beneficial relationship referred to as a symbiosis. And the endosymbiotic theory says that an early cell, probably some early bacterial prokaryote, first appeared on Earth. Nobody knows how, um, so you can theorize on the cosmology of that. But once these bacteria appeared on Earth as early life forms, the, these cells started to evolve. And so bacteria are still, to this day, a successful life form because they can continue to do what they do to make a living. However, some of these early cells may have been dispersed and encountered different environments that had challenges that caused them to change through mutation. Mutations can be random mistakes, changes the genetic code that maybe became beneficial, happy accidents, if you will. So that an early cell may have invaginated or caused an envelope-like structure to form inward from the cell membrane so that it could begin to possibly develop a nuclear membrane-like structure, which eventually gave rise to a nuclear membrane or a nucleus. And the chances of that happening are, are difficult to figure, but you can imagine that if in fact this happened at some point during Earth's life history, the nucleus would then be advantageous and, and kept as sort of like survival of the fittest because if the DNA could be housed in this extra internal structure, that would help to organize that DNA and possibly then give rise for more DNA to survive um, in this extra protective structure called the nucleus. And this may be how the first eukaryotes formed, but eukaryotes needed to grow larger to contain more DNA and maybe have room for such a nucleus. And at one point, or at many points during evolution, during these, apparent, these years of, of eukaryotic appearance, early on, these eukaryotes may have had the ability to ingest or engulf smaller prokaryotic life forms, such as various archaea and or bacteria. And some of those free living bacteria or archaea could have been photosynthetic and were making their living from using the sun's energy. And then it's estimated that some of these eukaryotes ingested but did not digest those free living bacteria or archaea and some of them, instead of being photosynthetic, may have been making their energy in a mitochondrial-like fashion or producing ATP 
but as this ATP producing bacterium or archaea uh, was put into a cell through ingestion, but then somehow not being digested, this may have given rise to what we know as mitochondria. Now, follow me here. This may seem far flung. Everything I'm saying, there are a lot of what ifs and how could this happen and what are the chances? But regardless of whether or not you buy this uh, would be story with so many what ifs over billions of years, let's take a look at the evidence that supports that what I'm describing here is very well what may have occurred. So there was a lady back in the 80s, 70s and 80s. She's very famous for the work that did, she did in her lab that came up with most of this evidence. She put it together as what's called the endosymbiotic theory. Her name was Dr. Lynn Margolis. And what she came up with as a series of observations that she discovered mostly in her lab um, is nothing short of, of just something that I think could have been Nobel Prize winning. Dr. Lynn Margolis described through investigating mitochondria and chloroplasts that both of these organelles have their own DNA. And that DNA is separate from the nuclear DNA that we think of in, you know, in the, in the nucleus. We're talking about mitochondrial DNA that is not linear like X's and Y's, but circular. And that DNA, when it's been genetically sequenced and analyzed, is strikingly similar to bacterial DNA. The same is true of chloroplasts. The separate DNA that chloroplasts have is circular and is highly similar to bacterial DNA, both in shape as well as sequence. Also, mitochondria and chloroplasts have both been discovered to have their own 70S ribosomes. And if you recall from this lecture, we know that 70S ribosomes were found to be a characteristic of bacterial life, whereas 80S ribosomes are what we typically think of when um, we describe eukaryotes. But yet, buried inside of all eukaryotes, whether it be in mitochondria or chloroplasts, the 70S ribosomes were found to have what's called 16S rRNA. And that rRNA is very much like bacteria, genetically speaking. Moreover, mitochondria and chloroplasts also have been found to be self-replicating. Imagine that when the energy needs of a cell goes up, say there's more sunlight or you have some muscles in your body, that need to do more work, right? Or a plant needs to do more photosynthesis. Whatever the stimulation is, the cell will, will have a shortage and these mitochondria or chloroplasts can sense that the concentration of energy in the cell is low. And if there's enough access to nutrients and resources, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts will sense that and actually dictate their own, they'll initiate their own replication process as if they were like bacteria living inside of us, yet they're a part of us. They're also the same size as bacteria. So approximately one micrometer tall by a few micrometers long, like a typical rod-shaped bacterium. Like similar to the size of any e. coli. And we can also say that both mitochondria and chloroplasts are double membrane bound in their structure. 
And this goes back to the whole endosymbiotic beginnings. The idea that I described in the previous slide that maybe these were once free living bacteria that a eukaryote came along and ingested by surrounding um, these early bacteria or archaea and, and wrapping a membrane around them, but then failing to digest them. And so they had their own original membrane, plus then another membrane that we surrounded them with and gave them a new home internally. And so the double membrane bound structure that all mitochondria and chloroplasts have may be evidence of an early event in evolution that we would refer to as an endocytosis, which basically means an ingestion, but not a digestion in this case. So all of these different characteristics that are listed here, own DNA, own separate ribosomes that are bacteria-like, self-replicating, same size as bacteria, this all suggests that inside of each and every one of us, there's a little bit of leftover early bacterial life that may have given rise to what we are at the cellular level. While we're on this topic, I thought I would end with this photograph taken from our book that's, upon first glance, appears to be a protozoan with what look like numerous countless cilia that it would use to swim around as motility structures. But what was discovered about this organism, which by the way lives in the gut of a termite, is that while it's swimming around digesting the cellulose from the wood that termites eat, those little extensions that allow this protozoan to travel around in the termite's gut are actually not cilia, but are spirochetes, small little bacteria that may have once been free living, but have attached themselves through little bracket-like structures that the, that the spirochetes are able to maintain themselves on. And so there's this symbiotic relationship, mutual benefit here. And uh, what a bizarre arrangement. They are not cilia, they're not flagella. In this final slide, these drawings depict uh, what we see in the previous slide, the picture of a protozoan with spirochete-like organisms that maybe once were free living, but now they find themselves inserted on the, these bracket-like structures of protozoans and their movement helps the protozoan then to have motility. And this symbiotic relationship that's displayed here is just another example of how there can be fusions of life that eventually just become something inseparable over time. Just like we see in each and every one of our cells, we have a bit of bacterial life buried inside of us. All, the, all those mitochondria may have once been free living bacterial organisms as the evidence shows. Fascinating indeed. And all happening invisibly at the, in the microbial world that we're now investigating.